conference. Thank you for that lovely welcome and the introduction. And can I just say this on behalf of millions of people around the country, to all teachers, thank you for what you do for our country and our children and the inspiration and help that you give them. <clears throat> I feel very honored to be invited here to speak to you today at the first ever conference of the National Education Union. And can I start by congratulating you on the merger of the NUT and the ATL. You've come together to speak, you've come together to speak with one collective voice. The old trade union slogan, unity is strength, is as true today as it ever was in our history. And I want to congratulate and thank your general secretaries, Kevin Courtney and Mary Boosted, for overseeing this merger. Kevin and Mary, thank you for bringing your unions together standing up for your members, and standing up for the principle of education as a right. Thank you very much. And I'd like to mention in particular the international solidarity work of the NEU. I'm thinking of your campaign against private fee-paying schools in the Global South, particularly in Kenya and Uganda, and your support for Palestinian teachers working in such difficult circumstances. <laughs> Especially since the United States chose to pull its funding from the UN Relief and Works Agency, and indeed I saw the work at first hand in refugee schools in Jordan last summer. But I have to thank the NEU for another reason. I want to thank you for inviting me to give a speech that isn't about Brexit. <laughs> because I think we've reached a stage where even political journalists are getting a bit tired of it. What happens with Brexit is, of course, vitally important, and the Labour Party is currently in talks with the government which are serious, and constructive, but I know people are fed up with all the other critical issues that affect their daily lives being ignored because of it. And education comes top of that list. <laughs> education is the pathway to liberation, not just for the individual, but for society as a whole. But that pathway, that vital pathway is becoming ever narrower. For years, the idea that education has value in and of itself has been in retreat and replaced by a much more limited notion that the only point of education is to meet the needs of the economy or business. That thinking has increasingly been reflected in the way that our education is delivered in the proliferation of testing and competition and the culture of educational institutions. And since 2010, this retreat has been hastened by the devastating effects of austerity on our education system, which has seen schools stripped back to the bone and university students loaded with debt. The result has been a narrowing of what education offers to people. Of course, a central task of the education system should always be to prepare young people for the world of work. But we believe that it must do more than that, that it must be broader, that education is a public good, and that encouraging creativity, critical thinking, and understanding of the world is important too. <clears throat> The language and methods of the market have invaded our schools and universities and encroached on young people's learning. Academies and free schools have, been brought, have brought the private sector into the heart of our children's education. But have they improved results? Have they empowered parents? You know the answers to those questions as well as I do. 
What they have done is introduced the concept of multi-academy trusts with chief executives on salaries of as much as 420,000. So I'm proud that at the Labour Party conference last September, Angela Rayner, our Shadow Education Secretary, announced... <laughs> ...announced that the next Labour government will immediately end the Academy and Free Schools programme. <clears throat> I want to... I want to thank... I want to thank Angela and her team for the work they're doing on this and for setting out a new agenda for education after nine years of conservative failure. And at the center of that agenda is the creation of a national education service, which will be the great legacy of the next Labour government. It will remove the corporations from the classroom and the campus. Because, because we believe that education is a right, not a commodity to be bought and sold. The National Education Service will make education freely available to everyone, whatever their age, from cradle to grave, just like the National Health Service. My great friend, Tony Benn, used to say that education should be like an escalator running alongside you throughout life, that you can get on and off whenever you want. What a wonderful way of putting the idea of access to education at any point in your life. So we will make free lifelong learning a reality, and we will abolish tuition fees. And at the other end of the age scale, but just as important, we will provide 30 hours of free early years provision for every two, three, and four year old. A very interesting and very well researched report of the House of Commons Select Committee on Education found huge inequalities in early years provision in England. And that has knock-on effects. A disadvantaged pupil in England is almost two years behind their peers by the time they take their GCSEs at the age of 16. Children who get a good start in life at preschool do so much better in schools and beyond. I want all of our children in every part of our country to get that good start. <laughs> School, schools should be about supporting every child in our society to reach their full potential, to explore where their talents lie and to discover their passions. A healthy society needs the full breadth of talents and skills that are developed in those very, very vital years. At primary school, in particular, children need the space and the freedom to let their imaginations roam. Instead, at the ages of just seven and 11, we put them through unnecessary pressure of national exams. I think that is wrong. And I think parents agree that is wrong. They don't want their children stressed out at a young age. SATs and the regime of extreme pressure testing are giving young children nightmares and leaving them in floods of tears. Teachers are reporting instances of sleeplessness and anxiety and depression even in primary school children during these exam periods. And it's even worse for children with special educational needs and disabilities. One teacher said to me that exams reinforce everything they can't do instead of what they're good at. <laughs> I 
why? Why are we doing this to our children? These excessive exams are not driving up standards, but they're driving up stress, both for children and for teachers. I meet teachers of all ages and backgrounds who are totally overworked and overstressed. These are dedicated public servants. It is just plain wrong. People go into the teaching profession because they want to inspire children. They want to educate them, not pass them along an assembly line. It's no wonder we have a crisis of teacher retention and recruitment. 40% of teachers leave the profession within five years of starting their training, often because of an unmanageable workload. And when the system forces teachers to teach the test, narrowing down the range of learning to core, subject, core parts of core subjects to get through exams, that's not actually helping pupils. We need to prepare children for life, not just for exams. <laughs> These tests are bad for children, bad for parents, and bad for teachers. We need a different approach. So today, I can give you this commitment. The next Labour government will scrap primary school SATs for seven and 11 years old. And we'll scrap the government's planned new baseline assessment for reception classes. Those, those tests can't give an accurate comparison between schools when pupils have such different backgrounds. Instead, we want to raise standards by freeing up teachers to teach. And that's because, and that's because Labour trusts teachers. You are the professionals. You do know your job, and you do know your students. So we will consult with teaching unions, parents, educational experts, and bring forward proposals for a new system that separates the assessment of schools from the assessment of children. And. It will be based on clear principles. First, to understand the learning needs of each child, because every child is unique. And secondly, to encourage a broad curriculum aimed at a rounded education. When children have a rich and varied curriculum, when they're encouraged to be creative, to develop their imagination, then there's evidence that they do better at the core elements of literacy and numeracy too. So I am very proud of Labour's arts pupil premium that will ensure children can learn musical instruments, drama and dance, visit theatres, galleries and museums. <laughs> these, these experiences are part of what makes us human brings us joy. Sh children should be allowed to be part of that. Let's let our children be free to develop their imagination. That surely is what the school years are for. The pressure heaped on primary children and teachers by SATs comes on top of the devastating impact of austerity on our schools. More than 90% of schools have had their per pupil funding cut. The first cuts to school funding in a generation. Classrooms are overcrowded. Support staff have been cut. Children are losing out. This is an attack 
on a whole generation who have been denied the start in life that they deserve. The shocking stories, and they are shocking stories we hear speak for themselves. Head teachers sending out begging letters to parents asking for money to buy basics like glue sticks and paper. Teachers staying behind after hours to clean classrooms. Schools closing on Friday as they simply don't have the money to pay the staff or pay the bills to keep the school open all week. This, in the fifth richest country in the world, this is the reality of nine years of conservative government and austerity. And although there isn't a single area of the country left unscathed, the cuts are hitting the most hard up areas and the most disadvantaged children the hardest. Children with special educational needs and disabilities, some of our most vulnerable young people are suffering particularly badly. According to your union, Special needs provision in England has lost out on more than a billion pounds since 2015 because of shortfalls in central government funding to local authorities. I commend the work of the NEU in exposing this scandal. I'm very worried that children with special educational needs are being permanently excluded from school at a rate six times higher than that of other pupils. We must not brush under the carpet the issue of school exclusions. Yes, some children can be difficult. These problems are often, as you know as well as I, very complex. But the increase in exclusions has been driven in part by austerity, as schools can't provide the support and they can't fall back on other services that are themselves being cut as well. Look further down the line of what happens to children that are excluded, the harm it can do to their life chances, and the greater cost to our society later on. We have a responsibility to ensure they have a fair chance. We shouldn't think that the issues affecting education can be separated from the rest of society. Children living in poverty, children going hungry, are not going to be able to concentrate in class, as the NEU survey released over the weekend shows. And when other services are cut, it's left to schools to pick up the pieces. Over 1,000 Sure Start centres have closed. 4,500 jobs in youth work, gone. And at the same time, some schools are having to organise food banks for families who can't afford to feed their children because of the cruelty of the universal credit system. We here, we hear of teachers having to source mattresses for students whose families can't afford them, and the staff supplying children with school uniforms which parents are unable to pay for. The circumstances children are living in have the biggest impact on their achievement at school. But it's easier for the government to blame the teachers. So I again want to repeat my thank you to all teachers, as I know you do this all the time, who dip into your own wallets and purses to make sure your children get something to eat. Every single teacher in this conference center today goes above and beyond what is expected of them. I mentioned the crisis of teacher retention and recruitment earlier, and it is a crisis, a crisis which stems from the government's obvious contempt for the entire profession. You are, sadly, undervalued and underpaid, because while you have taken a real terms pay cut of over 4,000 since 2010, the very richest in society have received tax breaks and giveaways. Under a Labour government, the whole approach to teachers and teaching staff will change. Not only, not only would we repeal the Trade Union Act and introduce se sectoral collective bargaining, the 
sectoral collective bargaining, which would give you the opportunity to improve your pay and rights at work, but we would genuinely listen to teachers and teacher unions about what you think is right for education. We value teachers, and we value the genius of those who teach. When we campaign against cuts to schools together, when we campaign for a different way of looking at education, we are all doing it for the next generation. We're doing it to ensure that there's a cascade of improvement from one generation to another. And we're doing it because we want to broaden what education offers to the next generation, not narrow it down. Because education is a public good, not a private commodity. When all of us, when all of us are allowed to flourish, when our talents aren't inhibited by circumstances or squandered through neglect, then the achievements of each will enrich the lives of others and the whole of our society benefits. So can I say to every teacher, again, thank you for what you do. To the support staff, thank you for what you do. Because, as you know, a school is a team. A team, cleaners, caretaking staff, support staff, teaching assistants and teachers. It's a big team that delivers for our children. And I want to say thank you to your union for the help, advice and information they've given us. When we work together, there's so much we can achieve. And if we stick together, we will win. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>